And we are live. Yeah, hello, I can't, people. can't say hello, hello to them. You're watching Fantastic Fiction at KGB. I'm Matthew Kressel, and I co-host the series with Ellen Datlow. Tonight's guests are Joe Hill and Laird Barron. We're going to get started probably in just a couple minutes. So relax, have a drink, pull up a chair. Uh, welcome. How is everyone doing tonight? Pretty uh, Real well. Yeah, as good mm -hmm. as can be. Joe, if you can email me the name of that author, I'd be interested. I would love to. Before we went live, we were talking about um, favorite reads of the year, and we drifted into discussing short stories, and I was mentioning uh, the short fiction of Otessa Moshfe, um, who is uh, one of the most exciting short story writers of her generation. And, mm -hmm. and the stuff she writes isn't exactly genre, but it's certainly very sick. You no, know, you kind of you kind of come away going, oh no, yeah, Don't no, do that. yeah. No, I read an interesting book, "Tender as the Flesh," I think it's called, um, um, and it's about cannibalism, basically. Um, and I think it's I can't hold. I need to look it up. Um, it it was really fine. I, let me see if I can find the author. Yeah. It's becoming more apropos every day. Yeah. I mean, that reminds me, you know, the two cannibals who got together for dinner, but one of them was late. And so all he got was the cold shoulder. Oh. oh man. <laughs> all right. Where, what happened to that? Tender of the Flesh by Augustina Basterica. Um, I think it's Brazilian. Oh, Argentinian. It's an Argentinian dystopian novel. And it's really terrific uh, from Scribner. I highly recommend that. Oops. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I mean, it's disturbing, <laughs> shall we say. Yeah, and I actually li I like Survivor Song a lot by Paul Tremblay. Right, that's another yeah, good one. That was totally exciting. I mean, just basically trying to get across a city, across a town, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, it just really grabbed you, you know, during an epidemic. My, uh, hey, you know, my both my younger brother is a terrific writer. Um, he wrote um, Sleeping Beauties with my dad and a novel called Double Feature. And he had a newsletter today, and one of his recommendations was Cold Storage by David Coep, which I think is all, I think is also a pandemic novel. Now I might be sure. I'm not I'm not sure about that. It's interesting that I I mean these people obviously wrote them way before the pandemic. Most of them, and yeah. so. Yeah. Something was in the air that was bringing these kind of stories out. No pun intended. Right. Right. So what's everybody drinking? So I'm, I'm having, I'm having a, a, a glass of writer's tears. Um, and I was, you know, I was saying earlier that my wife is an, is an editor with Galan's, the fantasy imprint and, and England, and she actually collects writer's tears. It's sort of why she got into the business. Right. Sweet, sweet writer's tears. <laughs> right. uh, I'm just drinking, I'm uh, just sherry, a lovely, my Pedro Jimenez, San Emilio cherry that tastes like raisins. That's very it's, lovely. It's amazing. Ooh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It really does take raisins. I shouldn't have poured so much, though. It's kind of heavy. <laughs> but uh, I'll give them back. Larry, what are you good. drinking? What's on uh, tap? <clears throat> Uh, Non-alcoholic tonight. I'm drinking Boylan Black oh, Cherry. Oh, is, nice, nice local which, soda. Oh, I like yeah, that. that's a big, that's a big favorite around here. I, um, I've just been so stressed out. I, I have, I've kind of backed away from drinking alcohol for the last few months. I, my stomach just isn't isn't handling it. But tonight, a nice soda for the reading. All right. I yeah. almost, I almost never drink except when I'm in KGB. Yeah. Well, I don't drink alone, so I have to have an excuse to drink with people. And I can't drink wine anymore. I've become allergic to it. Matt, what are you drinking? You're drinking that great. Uh, I'm drinking a rye IPA from uh, Rough Cut Brewery. There Ooh. in New York. It's pretty good. Sounds and good. Bob Flagger is, get, is getting an order of my sherry. Yes, you should get it. That's where I got mine from Astor. I had, I had port for the first, no, Madeira. I had Madeira for the first time um, so a few fun. weeks ago. I thought it was fucking disgusting. Oh no! It's I really thought it was absolutely <laughs> fucking disgusting. You just can't drink a lot of it, but it's very sweet. Oh, it's actually meant for after dinner rather than gulping it down. Like I this. guess. I mean, you know, it was like it was like a bag of black licorice gone horribly fucking wrong. <laughs> <laughs> How can black licorice go wrong? 
I'm not sure black licorice is ever right. I love black licorice, but I hate the salty licorice. I mean, that, like, I don't get it. Salty licorice is hard. You know what I really like is candied bacon. Candied I, bacon is so good. And I know a lot of people find it completely disgusting because they can't stand the mix of sweet and savory. I think it could be interesting. I've never had it. I've I don't think it. I've ever had it. I once had bacon flavored vodka, and that was I disgusting. Had bacon ice cream in it. Oh, how was that? It sounds kind of gross. <laughs> Bacon flavored vodka? Yeah, it sounds gross. It was awful. It was horrible. <sighs> bacon ice cream is delicious. That that sounds good. So what is which? So what is candied bacon? It's just like bacon that's um it's usually peppered, you know, it's a you know, it's a fried <coughs> bacon or grilled bacon or something, but then usually it's soaked in some kind of syrup. And you know, when you think about how good bacon tastes when you get some maple syrup on it, you know, you then you sort of got the idea. As long as it's crunchy, I'm happy. It's very crunchy. Oh, that's, that's so it's like you know, like I don't know if this is where we want our KGB conversation to go. <laughs> but if, but it, if, it goes places, it's all good. Yeah, I mean, it's great on a salad if you have like a salad with like you know peaches, oh, okay. sliced peaches, yeah. and a little blue cheese, and like um, some arugula or something like that. Um, and bacon, you know, crumbs. it's a terrific makes for makes for a terrific base for a salad. Yeah. Okay. Carrie is saying dessert wine is strictly for dessert in my book with a little bit of cheese. Yes. By itself at a random time, not so much. And um, maybe it would have been better. It's hard to believe that it would have been, it's hard to believe there are any circumstances when I would have enjoyed it, but maybe with the right kind of cheese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. check the comments and see what people are saying about Madeira. Yeah. They're saying things about all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Bacon and chocolate chip ch cookies. A bacon festival in Williamsburg. Yeah, candy oh. bacon. Right? Oh. Someone oh. wants to know what's the worst thing to get in your trick-or-treat bag. Money. Well, an apple. I'd much rather have candy. Yeah. When I want to do something healthy, it's like, are you kidding me? Who wants something healthy? You want, yeah. I want food, I want food is the worst thing to get in your trick-or-treat bag. You don't want food. My gave out apples. I said, no, you can't. How, yeah. about, how, about, how about someone's used paper virus shield, you know, the mask? <laughs> Maybe with a little crusty snot on the inside. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It smells like bad breath. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. You know what's bad? Like, none of us really knew what our pizza breath was like until we experienced having pizza and then putting on the face mask. Right. And now we all know. Yeah. We know a lot of things now. I we know a lot of things we never wanted to know. I mask, I wash them all the time, and I still put them on. They, what does it smell from? That's so weird. But I washed it. You know, it's open water. It's like uh, so. Now they're telling you if that if you go trick or treating and you wear a, ma a, a mask with your masquerade, you should wear your mask over it. You should be wearing two masks for trick or treating if you're a kid. Jesus, is it going to be trick or treating this year? I don't know. I mean, they're talking. Uh, if you do it. Question, right? Oh, some states will have trick or treating. They'll have right. they'll double they'll double down on trick or treating. What a bummer! No trick or treating. Mm. Yeah, so Daniel Dan Brown like, has more bacon in the yard. Thing is, is, thing is, if you go out, if you go out on Halloween evening and you come home with COVID, you really did get the trick instead of the treat. Right, mm -hmm. that's true. <laughs> Uh, if you're just tuning in, this is Fantastic Fiction at KGB. I'm Matt Gressel. Uh, I co-host a series with Ellen Datlow. This is our eighth month that we're doing it online. Uh, we normally do it at the KGB bar, but it's uh, it has been closed for the quarantine in New York City. Um, although uh, they just emailed us and they're actually open with limited capacity. So well, we said um, we're not coming back. Yeah, we were like, I don't think our, our audience is gonna is gonna come to a live reading just yet. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the hosts aren't either. So, I mean, uh, I mean, the whiskey is cheaper, you know, by Zoom. No offense to KGB, but yeah, no, it's yeah, not no, as high quality though. Yeah. It's different with friends. Yes. Yeah. yeah um, it's feel safe. Yeah. All right. So I guess we'll we'll uh, it's about seven ten. So I guess we'll we'll get started. So as I said, you're watching uh, fantastic fiction at, at KGB. I'm Matt Kressel, and uh, I co-host the series with Ellen Batlow. As I said, um, so this is a monthly speculative fiction reading series. It's held on the third Wednesday of every month, normally at the KGB bar, but now online on YouTube. Um, the series started in the late '90s by Terry Bisson and Alice K. Turner. 
Uh, they were attempting to bring together mainstream writers with writers of spec fiction in order to show, in Alice Turner's words, that at a certain level, they were plowing exactly the same field. In the spring of 2000, Ellen Datlow took over for Alice Turner. And in August 2002, Gavin J. Grant, publisher of Small Beer Press, stepped in for Terry Bisson when he moved to California. Author Matthew Kressel, that's me, stepped in for Gavin in 2008. Uh, we have a mailing list that we hope you will join. Um, I can't believe we've been doing it this long. I know it's been going. It's it's like it's gone so fast. I remember the day that we like I emailed Ellen. I'm like, there's no way we could go to the. This was like Mark. I'm like, I, I don't know Ellen. No, I, don't no, know. I mean in general. I mean doing it at all. I mean hosting. Oh, you mean you mean like Matt, I cannot. I've been hosting it for twenty years. Matt, you replaced Gavin Graham. Yeah. yeah. True trivia about Gavin Grant. He's actually nine feet tall. Yes, right. Eight, right. eight feet, he eleven inches taller because he's far away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. The and did you say that tonight's episode is sponsored by Jeffrey Tubin? <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> or Giuliani or Rudolph Giuliani. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. Man, what, a, what a day! What a news day, right? Yeah, we just need a third sex scandal. Oh man! Apparently, they've got Hunter Biden's hard drive, and it had an early copy of Borat's new movie film on it. Right. <laughs> um, um. Anyway, where were we? <laughs> anyway. Speaking, anyway. Anyway. All right. I'm gonna try to get fancy with some brands now. You guys ready? Um. Here we go. Some banners. Uh, all right. So, tonight's episode is sponsored by Nightfire Tour Books. Is Tor Books is new home for horror. Listen to the brand new season of Come Join Us by the Fire, featuring 27 free audio-only horror short stories. There are stories from Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, Seanan McGuire, and past fantastic fiction readers, including Caitlin R. Kiernan, Kelly Link, Cassandra Kaw, Maria Devana Headley, plus original stories from last month's fantastic fiction reader, Craig Lawrence Gidney, and tonight's reader, Laird Barron, plus many more stories. So visit the link below to download the anthology exclusively on Google Play. So we hope you'll check that out. Definitely cool. And also uh, Laird has a, a story in there, uh, Joran Fall. So definitely check that out uh, if you can. So thank you, Tor Nightfire. Um, <clears throat> I was yeah, just going to yeah. say one, just one little tidbit trivia. I talked to the person uh, responsible for recording it. They actually came up here to Stone Ridge and recorded some of the background for it, which I thought was really interesting. Cool. So, so when you say they recorded some of the background, like, like nature sounds or like what kind of. I, I'm not sure because I, I actually haven't heard the whole thing yet. So I'm not sure what, if it, what special effects are in there, but. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't know they were doing that because I don't. I haven't listened to it. Yeah, just that the sound engineer, he I was speaking speaking to him and he just said that he had, or actually maybe it was Teresa that, uh, DeLucci that to told me that, but yeah, that they were locally, they had locally recorded some of the, the sound for it. Maybe I'm wrong, it wasn't background, but the, the story was partially recorded. Some aspect of it was recorded here locally, which I thought was really mm -hmm. neat. That's pretty cool. Well, Teresa's, uh, I saw her in the comments, so maybe she can- uh, Only immersive audio book, exclamation point. What's that? Fully really immersive audiobook. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that means so it's um, audio drama. Teresa, is it like an audio drama? Well, you, uh, there's a oh, there's delay, it. like a few seconds, so it may take her a minute to respond. Um, just one more thing before we get into our readers. So the, the bar itself is, uh, like I said, it, it, it was shut down for the pandemic, but they just opened the last couple of weeks with limited capacity, but they're still, you know, financially suffering like a lot of businesses right now. So if you can um, support the bar by donating, there's a, a link below, uh, maybe the cost of a, of a hard or soft drink, five bucks, 10 bucks, anything helps the bar. Um, the bar itself is um, basically, it was a Ukrainian speakeasy for socialists during the McCarthy period. And it's kind of morphed into this um, literary bar in New York City, New York Times called it one of the best uh, literary venues in, in Manhattan. And, um, 
so uh, before the pandemic, almost every night of the week, there was some reading going on. It's fiction. Uh, you know, we have the spec fic KGB. They have lit literary fiction, poetry, other types of uh, creative arts there. Mm -hmm. So it's a great bar. We really hope it survives. Um, support it if you can. So, all right. Um, it is. It is like one of my. It is like one of my New York City happy places. It is really, you know, all teasing aside, right. um, you know, it's great the way they've supported this program over the years. Yeah, yeah, and and this picture here, this is actually a photograph from the the bar. It's it's like it's a beautiful dive bar in the best possible way. Like I, I just like I love the place so much. It's got such an atmosphere. It's mm -hmm. it's Soviet Soviet themed. Um, not sure if it's kitsch or not, but. Um, it's, it's just, it's got a great atmosphere. And then, uh, you know, we, we hope that when this whole thing's over, we can, we can go back there, but, um, yeah. So on, on to tonight's, uh, first reader tonight's first reader is going to be Laird Barron. Laird Barron spent his early years in Alaska. He's the author of several books, including the beautiful thing that awaits us all swift to chase and worse angels. His work has also appeared in many magazines and anthologies. Baron currently resides in the Rondout Valley, writing stories about the evil that men do. Here's Laird Baron. Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, I just want to thank Ellen and Matt for hosting. This is, um, well, the first, time I, the first time I was invited to read at KGB was back in 2009. So... Over 11 years, it was it was early in 2009 when I read, and I, I want to say this is my fourth or fifth uh, time I've been honored to be up, to be uh, at the program. So thank you for having me tonight. Uh, really uh, pleased to be here with Joe, and I want want to say thank you to the KGB uh, bar for hosting this. This is a really important um, program, and, they, and there's a lot of other important literary activities that occur there. And I, I'm really glad that KGB uh, supports the arts as they do. Uh, I want to say uh, we just we kind of let in with uh, T uh, Teresa DeLucci's uh, Come Join Us by the Fire season two. Uh, I have a story in there. I just want to say thank you to Teresa for taking that. Uh, just two other things. I want to say thank you to Ellen. Uh, she has several anthologies out, and I'm in one of them called, I think you can see that, called Final Cuts, uh, Tales of Hollywood Horror. And I want to give a quick shout out. I've been, we were talking about uh, books prior to uh, coming on tonight. And I have had the pleasure to read several manuscripts uh, uh, prior to their publication. And this is, this is one short story collection that has come out that I did a quote for Clint Smith, uh, The Skeleton Melodies. And it's a weird fiction uh, horror collection. It's a sophomore collection. Can't recommend it highly enough. Um, so now I'll get into my, get into my story. Uh, I'll give you guys a quick trigger warning. Uh, it's rated R for various adult situations per a typical Laird Baron joint. Uh, also special warning, please be aware of an anecdote depicting brief animal and animal violence. It's called Lorn. Two and a half hours before sunset, the Arnaz brothers parked their Dodge in a dirt lot with a view up and down Forlorn Street. Someone had ripped the sign in half like a ragged fingernail, so now it said Lorn. This end of town was as legendary Ofer returned to the wilderness. There were no standing houses nor people, only ruins and the small creatures that inhabit such places. Thorn bushes and invasive bittersweet vines choked lost driveways. Shade trees loomed, their roots erupting from sidewalks. Limbs of the white oaks, eastern white pine, and sycamores occasionally shifted with the breeze from the mountains. The canopy brushed against a dusty blue crepe paper heaven. Though familiar with its precincts in bygone years, neither brother lived in the town of Eel Neck they had been summoned. Animals aren't innocent. I met a dog who was a serial killer. Casey lowered the window and lit a cigarette. Bullshit, Paul said. His mother went by her maiden name, Crampier, before she'd met Casey's father and changed it to Arnaz. Upon reaching majority, Paul hyphenated his surnames as the mood struck him. 
he usually signed Arnez on everything except legal documents. Ask those jerkwads in 19th century Kenya who got mauled. A pair of lions stalked the province for years, eating peasants, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Killed for the hell of it, too. Decorated their cave with human bones. That was a movie, bro. Based on real events. And then there was a sloth bear who defaced a dozen villagers in Bangalore. Defaced. Peeled them like decals. Animals can be murderers, is all I'm saying. In the situation I know, it was a furry, adorable mutt. Paul wanted a cigarette, too, but his girlfriend had made him kick. The cab of the truck was roasting hot and tasted like metal, vinyl, and smoke. The windshield glass, starred by the impact of many pebbles and manufactured back when American trucks were designed after tanks, seemed to focus light with the intensity of a magnifying lens. He unwrapped a stick of gum and stuck it into his mouth. He said, when? I don't know, before mom and dad got hitched. Junior high, I guess. Paul didn't ask Casey to go on, but Casey went on. Dude, we knew, operated a kennel of huskies. He advertised an Alaskan-style mushing experience. His dogs pulled tourists around a dirt loop on carts in the summer and sleds in the winter after it snowed good. Some of his younger dogs turned up dead, no visible marks except some blood around the snout and jaws. A vet performed a necropsy and said, blood force trauma did for him. One day our friend happened to witness a big husky attacking a yearling. The husky slipped through a chain link fence and rammed the pup with the crown of his skull. When the older dog realized he'd been caught, his whole attitude transformed. He wiggled and his tongue lolled. He tried to play with the pup who was lying there dying of crushed organs. Acted like it was all a joke, a misunderstanding. And that's what freaked the owner. It went beyond how dogs behave. The animal was sly, almost human. Nothing worse than almost when you're talking about clever animals. A phrase occurred to Paul, like a rotten log bobbing to the surface of a dark lagoon. The uncanny valley. What? Casey flicked his cigarette butt away with an irritated expression, perhaps embarrassed that he continued to smoke in his brother's company. Come on. He climbed down from the truck and stretched. His arms were sleeved with tattoos. Let's get the lay of the land. Catbirds shrilled. A door slammed somewhere a long way off in another century. They walked north toward Hooper Lane, where they'd seen cars parked and people moving about. Uh, the estate is that away. Paul indicated a vague spot behind them. This whole valley is fucking uncanny, Casey said lighting <clears throat> yet another cigarette. His brain didn't operate in a reliably linear fashion. You in a hurry to snoop around Eric's property? Probably have to machete our way past a thicket just to reach the front yard, and it'll be dark pretty quick. Knock yourself out, though. Paul was very much not in a hurry. Well, the high school isn't far. Could be coyotes or something to end up there. He said it to Casey's back. His brother strode on, smoke unraveling over his shoulder. Upon arriving earlier that afternoon, the Arnez brothers cruised through the north side of town, rolling past gas stations, shopping centers, warehouses, and apartment complexes. The crown jewel in a chain of decaying rural settlements Eel Neck was established in colonial times as a trading post that peaked gloriously in the 1940s and again in the 1980s. It sprawled atop a sloping butte above a river with low green mountains all around. The river wound sluggishly south and east along the valley floor, connecting somewhere to another bigger river. Natives had farmed its murky waters. English and Dutch colonists usurped the tradition harvesting eels by the wriggling ton in huge stone weirs now fallen into disrepair. Buildings were grimy and weathered, except for a credit union splash banana yellow that shocked the senses with its gaudiness. Too many businesses were closed. Too many residents had departed for the distant cities. One got the sense of an organism contracting and calcifying, reabsorbed into nature block by block. 
Superintendent Janus appeared similar, yet slightly different since last the brothers saw him. Leaner, more angular, and singularly morose. He perched rather than sat. A dope dealing acquaintance from their post high school years, and now an important bureaucrat who operated the town's finicky political apparatus. He'd arranged to meet them at a diner. His supervisory position sounded not unlike a battlefield promotion. Functionaries higher on the ladder had quit or gotten fired or died, and eventually the keys to the kingdom slipped into his hands. Be careful what one wishes for, never rang more truly. The Indian casino in the next county drained custom from the local bars and lone nightclub. The playhouse, so vibrant and popular at the beginning of the millennium, was kept afloat entirely by the largesse of private donors. Even the historical downtown movie theater found itself facing dire budgetary constraints, thanks to internet and cable programming. He bought the men lunch and explained these problems and many, many others, including that which compelled him to request their services. Pets have gone missing, the superintendent said. Cats, dogs, a goat, a sow. She won a blue ribbon at the county fair, 370 pounds of pork on the hoof. Mostly cats, mostly dogs. He wore an expensive suit and prescription glasses that dimmed or cleared according to the light. At the moment, the lens were moderately smoky. Hooper Lane, Gaston Street, over to Chase and Hunter, terrible neighborhoods, dark ages. Then you have the re decent folks on Cherry Avenue, Atlas and Welm Boulevards. That's where a lot of the critters were snatched. People around those parts expect results from City Hall. They aren't happy that someone or something is nabbing Kitty Cat and Fido. The mayor hears his people. <laughs> you need animal control. Casey sipped coffee, feigning diffidence in hopes of steepening the eventual fee. Or a park ranger with a trank gun. Our animal control guy won't investigate. Why not? South End might as well be the Darien Gap. Certain folks think <clears throat> certain folks think there's leftover trouble at the Uruk Estate. Leftover trouble, Casey said. Fifteen years makes for a mighty cold plate. Well, I agree. It's a fact that Uruk's entire menagerie was captured or euthanized. Well, so they say. Come on, the superintendent said. The locals are excitable. One damned hyena jumps the estate fence and mangles a paper boy, and that's the urban legend hung around our necks like a boat anchor for the next half century. You understand why I can't get me volunteers, though. The Arnezes exchanged a glance. Paul had helped shaft the superintendent over a quarter baggie of weed once upon a time. Water under the bridge, according to the official. Nonetheless, Paul keenly wished to make amends. He nudged his brother. I saw squad cars cruising Maine, Casey said, ignoring the nudge. A guilty conscience was not among his faults. Superintendent Janus smiled dismissively. Fuck the police. You knew Uric, right? Well, everybody knew that rich, eccentric Guthrie Uric squandered a fortune bankrolling expeditions to foreign lands, attempt upon capturing beasts for his private zoo, and eventually he died. The creatures ran amok on the property which led to an epic shit show now spoken of in hushed voices. Uh, I, I did the lawns at the house one summer, Paul said to the superintendent. Before, close enough for government work, so to speak. Look, go recon the situation. If you can help me out, I'll cut you a check. Hell, I'm a sport. If you poke around and decide you can't help me, I'll still cut you a check. When the brothers hesitated, he said, you boys owe me just a little bit of consideration. Here, take this. He opened his wallet and handed Casey a C-note in several 20s. I know what you're thinking. Nothing like a public official distributing cash to a pair of seedy dudes, eh? He laughed. Relax. Nobody around here gives a lick about my business, and you two sad sacks may as well be invisible. Casey slipped the money into his shirt pocket. He supposed they could do their buddy a favor. And Paul knew his brother supposed so because they'd fallen nearly a month behind on rent. Casey went on to ask how many pets had vanished. Oodles and oodles. Superintendent Janus smoothed his tie. 
sunlight beamed through a window and his glass and glasses blackened entirely. Oodles of poodles. Scene break. It seemed prudent to heed the superintendent's advice. The brothers canvassed the nicer neighborhoods, interviewing a handful of locals who deigned to answer their doors. One nervous dude fondled a katana. In short order, it became clear that a curse hung over South End. Yes, indeed. Numerous dogs and cats of various breeds and sizes disappeared on a routine basis. And yes, a huge goddamn pig had been taken. Who gave a flying fuck and a rolling donut about the prize-winning sow? Hadn't they heard? Pets and livestock weren't the going concern. Sinister shapes lurked among the bushes. Folks drove straight to work and home again, or went in pairs if they absolutely had to walk. Nobody let children play in the yard unattended. Dogs yipped and yapped in the night. Utter collapse of civilization. Everything south of Chariot was lost. Bolt High was likely a haven for miscreants, four-legged or two. Gods only knew what might be occurring at the Uruk Mansion. The drunk ex-soldier who lived in a camper on a vacant lot near Vesuvius Park had recently vanished. While the soldier wasn't exactly missed, who'd be next? When did the damnable buffoon of a mayor intend to take action? Are you too high? You sure look high. Casey asked whether anyone had actually seen coyotes or other predators. Predators, one citizen sneered. Those feral assholes who lived above the ravine were 100% 100 guaranteed to be the source of any dog napping or other less concretely defined shenanigans. They've gone to the old ways. Go bother them. We will, Casey said with an eye roll to Paul as the duo took their leave. Now, the lunch meeting with the superintendent and subsequent canvassing well behind them, the brothers hiked several blocks along Florence Street before turning onto Hooper. Trier, trees reared high and full, their crowns bent close together until the sky was a bright slash whose light fell mistily and reflected against bushes and floated in wavering panels on concrete and asphalt. Green leaves and beds of black needles smelled nearly as primeval and raw as they would in the depths of a virgin forest. The vehicles they'd spotted earlier were, upon inspection, abandoned and inoperable, judging by the filthy windows and flattened tires. Weeds grew in their shadows. Dead leaves collected upon windshields and dirt and pollen scum too. Structures or their remnants could occasionally be glimpsed beyond wild hedges and under thick nets of vines. A considerable jaunt down the lane, away from the epicenter of whatever creeping apocalypse was in progress, vegetation thinned to reveal houses that were possibly habitable. One split level had its patio doors boarded and a ratty tarp draped over the second story windows. A comfortable, even expensive home, inexplicably gone to seed. Three shirtless adolescents squatted in the driveway, skinning an animal. Paul wasn't sure what kind. The kids sang a guttural song in three-part harmony. A tall man in a ball cap and a stained Columbia University t-shirt oversaw the project. The man flashed a three-finger claw in greeting or threat. His left hand went behind his back and Paul wished they'd brought the rifle. We aren't really badass hunters, even counting the white tail Casey bagged once in a blue moon. Handyman jobs, landscaping, woodcutting. Those are our regular gigs. We're just a couple of idiots willing to massage our resumes to make a dime. The bearded man smiled. The kids also grinned evilly and made claws of their bloody fingers. Casey's stride faltered, an indication that his mouth might be shifting into gear. Certain folks referred to them as the Rooster Brothers, as both were short and wiry and given to rubbernecking with pop-eyed intensity. Casey possessed a well-earned reputation for belligerence. Thankfully, this time, he shrugged and moved on. Paul kept pace, an itch burned in the center of his spine. The lane climbed until it made a T. Gaston Street ran north and south. Ahead was a clearing and the remains of a school with its walls yet upright. The roof caved in places and peeled and flung away and others. 
a plaque over the front entrance spelled Bolt High School. Underneath, someone had spray painted M. De Good Lives in neat block, yellow block letters. A lot of real little fuckers went here, huh? Casey said. He played safety in his senior year and owned a scar on his chin to remind him. Some weren't exactly little, Paul said. Fuckers, though. The main doors were gone. Windows everywhere were also gone. The expansive lawns were covered in pale knee-high grass. Casey checked for tracks or spore, but didn't discover any clues. Past the entrance spread an open-air maze of corridors and rooms, much of it covered in more grass. No sign of either graffiti or refuse, as one might expect to find in an abandoned building. Small animals had encamped, however. Wasps hung paper nests high in corners. Chipmunks scuttled along rotted baseboards. Sparrows perched in lattices of morning glory and grapevine, coldly observing the interloping humans who edged along a trail of beaten grass. That uncomfortable sensation between his shoulder blades returned. <clears throat> Should have brought the rifle. This time, Paul said it aloud. Casey didn't respond. He would have commented that the damn thing was too heavy anyhow, which was true. Or he might have admitted the weapon was a poor choice against coyotes or dogs or other small, fast-moving predators. They stopped at the entrance to the gymnasium. The bleachers were in a shamble of upended planks smashed by a giant's fist. A sculpture in the shape of a pyramid reared above a sinkhole in the center of the grassy parquet floor. The sculpture was composed of partially melted truck tires, scorched cinder blocks, and animal skeletons surmounted by a shallow concrete birdbath that cupped a glitter ball. Sunbeams reflected off the mirrored plates. Dust and motes of dandelion puff drifted in the reddening light. Clouds moved glacially across the sky and the black shadow of the pyramid undulated closer to the brothers. A mysterious understanding bloomed within Paul. Nature revolts, he remembered. They've gone back to the old ways. That's what the man said, back to the old ways. Casey turned slightly, his attention divided. Bro, this looked like nature to you? An altar to the green. Ah, behold the handiwork of local yokels. Rumors were true. This town is chock full of loonies. She rises up, she bears her fangs. Casey grabbed his brother's arm. We came, we saw, it's a bust. Paul allowed himself to be half dragged toward the school entrance. Nature never gets tired, she never rests. His lips, someone else's words. Whatever you say, be like her and move your ass. They stood panting in the middle of Gaston Street. The sun had dropped and the freestanding walls were backlit by the crimson sky. Casey lit a cigarette, of course, affecting the steely calm of his childhood idols, Eastwood and Wayne. I didn't see signs of a den. Bro, where are you going? Paul ignored him. Fresh out of bravado, he stumbled back toward the truck. Or anywhere. And that's where I'll leave you. Excellent. Okay. Yay! <laughs> part of a story? Right. What is Let that? Me, uh, I omitted that part. It's a story I'm working on. I'm working on several projects. But uh, this is this is one of them. It's called Lorne. Yeah, it's you know, I mean, there's a bit more. To, I've, I've actually there's a, there's quite a bit more done, but I still have a little bit to do on it. So it's it's you know, it's not edited. It's raw. But um, hope you enjoyed it. Good. It's effective. It's great. So we're gonna take a break for about five minutes, and then we'll be back. We'll be back in five minutes with Joe Hill. Stick around.
friend like don't worry we'll sort that and i was like well we back. <laughs> yeah, we'll give it another minute or two. For <coughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, everyone, stick around. We're going to do a yeah, Q so and A after. Yeah. So think of your questions reading. that you might have for them each. Each of them. <clears throat> and don't forget, you can sign up for um, on on for our newsletter. Is that does that come up? If you just go to. Fantastic Fiction at KGB, you can sign up for the newsletter. And all we do is send a message twice a month or so about this, and that's it. We don't spam you. Man, this is such a professional production. <laughs> you guys really know what you're doing. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, the, the platform we use is called StreamYard, and they, they make it really easy to mm. do. Linda wants the rest of the story. You'll have to wait till he finishes it, I think. <laughs> yeah. I'm working on it. <laughs> hey, you oh. guys out there in comments land, are uh, are you having a good October? I know it's been a tough year. Yeah. it's a, It feels like a tough 10 years, but yeah. I know. It's just like <laughs> never. My beard was completely dark when 2020 started. I you know. say you ran out of color? <laughs> I saw him the other day and I said, oh my gosh, when did you turn gray? When did you get a I'll gray? tell you what was scary. I'll tell you what was scary was, um, you know, in the spring, there was the run on the supermarkets and suddenly uh, it was impossible to get toilet paper. Right. And, yeah. But fortunately for me, my publisher supplies me with plenty of back issues of my own comics. <laughs> um, so I was never really in any danger of running out of uh, essential supplies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember when I first went to London in in the nineteen late nineteen sixties, the toilet paper there was like wax paper. It was so <laughs> terrible. I mean, I don't think Jillian was born yet, so I don't even know if she knows. You know, but somewhere there's a link somewhere out there in uh, YouTube land. There's an ad about artisanal um, birch <laughs> bark toilet paper. Uh. <laughs> crafted especially for hipsters. Yeah, right. Pretty classic. Yeah, no, it's pretty awful at that point. You know, you could Yeah, that's a TARDIS behind me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I see in the comments there's a question about a TARDIS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, you know, um, I actually got a chance to pitch on Doctor Who. It was really important to me as a young father because it was a show I shared with my kids and I fell so hard for the David Pennant you know, doctor, I just thought that was such an incredible run of stories and great writing and great acting and just hilarious and fun. And uh, I had a chance to pitch on it. And I thought, if I get to do this, I will be the coolest father alive for at least 10 minutes for my kids. And this stuff's important when you're a young dad. So, so I worked up three of my absolute best pitches. I did my absolute best thinking ever. And um, I am I actually was lucky enough to get to have Neil Gaiman review them. So he actually edited my pitches and said, they will like this. They won't like this. I'd love more of this. Um, I don't think we need any of that. Um, and it was great. It was like one of the best editorial conversations I've ever had in, you know, in my life. I mean, Neil, Neil has come to his true calling very late you know, very late on in his career because he'd be a great showrunner. Um, but in any event, I sent in my three absolute best pitches to the BBC and a producer with the show got back to me with a very brief email saying, we have never let an American write for Doctor Who. And if we were going to, we wouldn't start with you. Wow. Oh. <laughs> now I want to read those pitches. You, you know, are you are you ever going to publish them somewhere, or you might? I've recycled read? a bunch of the ideas into various stories, so there wasn't anything. You know, I don't really believe anything goes to waste. I mm -hmm. uh, I wrote um, two books and part of a third book before I finally got the ideas and horns right. You know, my second novel was actually my fourth attempt to wrestle with a set of ideas um, that I had been playing with for over a decade. I don't really think anything goes to waste, but a lot of stuff does get recycled. That's right. Right. Yeah, by the way, Melanie has a question. You can ask it later, but actually very little, very few of Laird's stories are about animal 
evil about animal bad things happen because he loves animals. But he'll I'm sure later he can recommend things that don't have any animal violence in them. Well <laughs> Oh Kay Huber came back. I know animals hearing about stuff happening to animals can be tough. Yeah. Um, you know, when people have different tolerances for for what they can take in their fiction, I understand that. But I also think I also think when you come across someone who's cruel to animals, um, you know, talk about talk about catching a serial killer in the bun. I mean, oh, that was a true story actually that I worked into at the start about the husky. That actually happened to somebody that I know. Uh, the dog killed a bunch of other dogs and was killing young dogs, like a serial killer. Yeah. Every, it's just, um, I don't, you know, to me, there's a difference between dwelling, lovingly dwelling on details versus, no, this is something that happened in passing. So I totally understand. I totally understand that people have, a, I have, I always, whenever I watch a horror movie, I always check to see if the dog dies, not because I have a low threshold for animals getting bumped off in a show, but because I don't like gratuitous, like the dog's only there to excite your 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 pity. I don't, okay, I, don't I gotta like tell that. a quick story though. I gotta tell a quick story. Um, so so um, so when I was a, a like a teenager, um, you know, me and one of my closest friends, Shane, um, went to go see a highly anticipated big summer blockbuster, Independence Day. And, and we're watching the film and there are these giant city-sized spaceships over all of America's urban centers and then they fire the death ray. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a bunch of people in a subway tunnel, or not a subway tunnel, in an under, you know, a tunnel, a, an interstate tunnel under LA. You know, thousands of people stacked up, you know, bumper to bumper in their cars. And the death ray hits and they're completely incinerated except for this one plucky golden retriever who leaps out ahead of the flames. And I, I saw this and escapes the death ray. And I saw this opening night in Bangor, Maine. And when that golden retriever escaped the flames, like 800 people in the audience stuck their fists in the air. And they were like, yeah! <laughs> and, and me and my buddy Shane were like, uh, didn't 800 people just burn to death in a tunnel? Right. Acceptable um, trade, acceptable trade. Yeah. You know, and and so then a week later, another film came. And so we were like both kind of disappointed with Independence Day. Like, oh, at the end, we came away from that film feeling like, uh, wasn't really, you know, the aliens, you know, the James Cameron type experience that we were hoping for. So a week later, another big anticipated film came out and I missed it and Shane went to go see it. And I was feeling really bummed and I called him the next day and I said, how was the movie? And he said, eh, the dog lived. Hmm. And ever since then, I mean, for it's like we're going 30 years now. The dog lived remains our shorthand for a film that panders. You know, for a story that for a story that shamelessly panders, which doesn't mean I root for animal violence. It just means like, you know, when 800 people get incinerated in the tunnel, but you're excited because the golden retriever lived. Uh, maybe your priorities are not completely in the right place. I don't think I'll ever be accused of the, the dog panderer. <laughs> I love them, but they're like my other characters. They takes their chances. Yeah. OK, should we start? Our, ne our next guest, welcome back, everybody. And uh, Joe Hill is the number one New York Times bestselling author of Full Throttle, Strange Weather, and The Fireman, among other books. Much of his work has been adapted or is in development for film and TV. His third novel, Nosferatu, was the basis for the AMC program of the same name, with his comic Lock and Key, co created with artist Gabriel Rodriguez, is now a hit series for Netflix. This fall, he has had several graphic novels released under his Hill House comic imprint with DC, including his own Basket Full of Heads and Plunge. Please welcome Joe Hill. Hey. So um, I'm going to read a piece from um, a short story in the new collection, Full Throttle. Uh, Full Throttle is now out in uh, this beautiful trade paperback, um, which you can book, pick up at a bookseller near you. 
Um, but uh, I, so I'm going to read a section from. It's pretty long. It's almost a novella length short story. Um, and uh, in the section I'm going to read, uh, which I hope goes well, I've, I've never read this uh, live before, but um, some people are gathering together at the Four Seasons Hotel in Boston. They're in a, 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 a fancy pants hotel room to hear a presentation um, about an opportunity to go on a very special hunt. Um, and uh, let's just go for it. Okay. When the bell chimed, Stockton went to the door of the suite and opened it a crack. Fallows was in the hall. Come in. Be careful, though. It's dark in here, Stockton warned him. What's with the lights? Fallows asked as he slipped into the room. Are we attending a presentation or a seance? The lights were off and the curtains drawn in Mr. Charn's corner suite on the fourth floor of the Four Seasons, across from the Boston Common. A single lamp shone on the nen table, but the usual light bulb had been swapped out for one that was tinted red. Stockton had expected the red light. Stockton had seen the Edwin Charn show before. He opened his mouth to explain, or try to explain, or at least press fallows to be patient, but Charn spoke first. Get used to it, tip fallows, came the reedy voice, wavering with age. If I offer you a spot on my next hunting party, you'll need to get used to the half-light. What's to be shot on the other side of the little door will be shot at dusk, or not at all. Charn sat in a striped easy chair to the left of the love seat. He wore a sprightly yellow bow tie and suspenders that pulled his pants too high. Stockton thought he dressed like the benevolent host of a television program for small children, one where they practiced naming the colors and counting to five. The boys sat together on the love seat, Peter in a tailored Armani suit, Christian in a blue blazer. Christian didn't come from money, had made it to private school on his wits. Stockton was proud of his son for looking past the other boys' secondhand wardrobe and for quietly accepting Christian's broke, shy, strictly religious foster parents. Of course, Christian was probably the only reason Peter himself had graduated from private school. Stockton was sure Christian let him copy on exams, and he'd probably written more than a few of Peter's papers. That pleased Stockton as well. You looked out for your friends, and they looked out for you. A birdcage sat on the coffee table covered with a sheet of red linen, or maybe it was white linen and only looked red in the horror house light. Stockton wasn't sure. If Stockton were running the presentation, he would have started with the bird cage, but he wasn't, and Charn wouldn't. Thanks for agreeing to meet me, Mr. Charn, Fallow said. I'm very interested to hear about the little door. Stockton tells me there's nothing like it anywhere in the world. Charn said, yeah, he's right enough. Thank you for coming all the way to Boston. I don't much care to leave, Maine. I don't like to leave the door for long, and tisn't necessary for me to travel widely, to drum up business. Word passes around. The truly curious come to me. I offer only the two hunts a year, and the next is on the 20th of March. Small groups only, price non-negotiable. I heard about the price. That's most of the reason I came. The sheer entertainment value of hearing what kind of hunt a person could get for a quarter of a million dollars. I can't imagine. I spent 40000 to kill an elephant and felt I overpaid. Mr. Charn raised an eyebrow and cast a questioning look at Stockton. If it's beyond your means, sir, then... He's got the money, Stockton said. He just needs to see what he'd get for it. He spoke with a certain smooth, confident humor. He had not forgotten how he himself felt when he was in Fallow's boots, recalled his own disgust at the price tag and his icy unwillingness to be conned. The pitch had turned him around, and it would turn follow Fallow's around, too. I'm just wondering what I could possibly shoot that would be worth that kind of bread. I hope it's a dinosaur. I read a Ray Bradbury story about that when I was a kid. If that's what you're offering, I promise not to step on any butterflies. Fallows laughed. Charn didn't. His calm was almost uncanny. 
And if I do shoot something, I understand I can't even keep the trophy, all that money, and I bring home squat? Your kill will be preserved, mounted, and kept at my farmhouse. It may be viewed by appointment. For an additional fee? For no additional fee? That's decent of you. Stockton heard the edge in the old soldier's voice and fought down an urge to put a restraining, comforting hand on Fallow's arm. Charn wouldn't be offended by a brittle tone or a sarcastic implication. Charn had heard it all before. He'd heard it from Stockton himself only three years ago. Of course, viewing is free, although should you like to take tea while you're visiting, there is a modest service charge. Charn said it in a blasé tone. Now I should like to share a short video. It is not professionally produced. I made it myself quite a while back. Still, I feel it is more than adequate to my needs. The video you are about to see has not been altered in any way. I don't expect you to believe that. In fact, I am sure you will not. That is no matter to me. I will establish its veracity beyond any doubt before you leave this room. Charn pressed a button on the remote. The video opened with a view of a white farmhouse against a blue sky on the edge of a field of straw. Titles whisked onto the screen, sliding from left to right. Charn Estate, Rumford, Maine. They were the sort of titles you could create in camera if you didn't care that it made your video look like childish junk. There was a cut to a second floor bedroom with homey New England touches. An urn patterned with blue flowers stood on the bedside table. A brass bed dressed with a handmade quilt took up most of the space. Stockton had slept in that very bed on his last trip, trip to Rumford. Well, not slept. He had lain awake the whole restless night, springs digging into his back through the thin mattress, field mice scuttling frantically in the ceiling. The thought of the day to come had put sleep well out of reach. New titles swept in, chasing off the previous titles. Four rustic bedrooms, shared bathroom facilities. Pretty sure rustic means cold and uncomfortable, Stockton heard his son murmur to Christian. Good Christ, the kid was loud, even when he whispered. The video jumped to a shot of a small green door. A grown man would have to crawl through it. Set at one end of a room on the third floor of the farmhouse. The door, Stockton thought, with the passion of a convert, heedlessly crying out hallelujah at the sight of a holy relic. The sight of it inspired and delighted him in a way his son never had not even on the day of his birth. The ceiling was low on the top floor, and at the far side of the room, opposite the camera, it banked steeply downward, so the far wall was only about three feet high. The room contained a single dusty window with a view of the field outside. A new title swept onto the screen. The little door is open for curated hunts twice a year. Charn services cannot guarantee a kill and full payment is regar requ required regardless of outcome. Stockton heard Fallows exhale, a brief, hard snort of disquiet. The old soldier was frowning, three deep wrinkles in his brow, his body language stiff with unease. Up until now, Stockton thought, Fallows had assumed that the little door was the name for a private compound. He had not expected an actual little door. The title zipped off the screen. Then the camera was outside, on a hillside, in the dusk, or the dawn. Who knew? The sun was below the horizon, but only just. A flight of stone steps descended through high strands of pale, dead-looking grass and disappeared among bare, desolate trees. It didn't resemble the land around Charn's house, and it didn't look at all as if it had been shot the same time of year. The earlier material had depicted high summer. This was Halloween country. The next cut took the viewers inside a hunting blind, situated well off the ground, and placed them in the company of two hunters, hefty silver-haired men dressed in camouflage. The one on the left was recognizable as the CEO of one of the best, biggest tech outfits. He'd been on the cover of Forbes once. The other was a highly regarded lawyer who had defended two presidents. Fallows rocked back on his heels and some of the tension abandoned his posture. There. He wasn't going to walk out of the room just yet. Nothing reassured a man about an investment, 
like knowing that richer and more powerful men had gone first. The CEO settled onto a knee, the butt of the gun against his shoulder, and about an inch of barrel protruding through the opening in the side of the blind. From here, it was possible to see that staircase of rough stone blocks descending into the valley below. The steps were no more than 30 yards away. At the bottom of the hill, through a screen of wretched trees, it was possible to detect a flash of dark moving waters. Hunting is not permitted on the other side of the river, Charn said, nor is exploration. Anyone discovered to have crossed the river will have his hunt terminated immediately and will not receive a refund. What's over there? State land? Fallows asked. The dolman, Stockton murmured, and the sleeper. He spoke without meaning to, and his own to Oh, sorry, that was actually Stockton, not Charn. The dolman, Stockton murmured, and the sleeper. He spoke without meaning to in his own tone, reverent, wistful, drew an irritable glance from the other man. Stockton paid him hardly any mind. He had seen her once from across the water, and some part of him longed to see her again, and some part of him was afraid to go anywhere near. A flickering light moved into the shot, climbing that distant crude staircase. It was the figure of a man holding a torch with a lurid blue flame. He was too far away to see clearly, but he appeared to be wearing baggy, furry pants. They were coming to it now. The boys on the couch sensed it and leaned forward in anticipation. The camera zoomed in. The CEO and the lawyer disappeared from the shot, and for a minute the figure on the stairs was an indistinct blot. Then the picture sprang into sharp focus. Fallow stared at the TV for a long, silent moment and then said, Who's the asshole in the costume? The figure on the steps was hoofed, his legs sleekly furred in a glossy brown coat, his ankles bent backward close to the hoof like the ankles of a goat. His torso rose from the flanks of a ram, but it was the bare, grizzled chest of a man. He was naked except for a stiff-looking vest, faded and worn, patterned in gold paisley. A pair of magnificent spiraled horns curved like conch shells from his curly hair. His torch was a bundle of sticks wired together. He's carrying a devil thorn torch, said Charn. It crackles and turns green in the presence of menace. But fortunately for our purposes, its range is limited to just a few yards. A Zeiss victory scope will put you well beyond its reach. The camera zoomed back out to include the shoulder and profile of the gunman in the frame. Shit, muttered the CEO. I'm shaking. I'm actually shaking. The bearded grotesque went still, frozen place on the faraway stone steps. He had the quick, almost instantaneous reactions of a gazelle. The gun cracked. The fawn's head snapped straight back. He tumbled bonelessly, end over end, down three steps, and wound up crumpled in a fetal position. Yeah, bitch! The CEO shouted, and turned to give the famous lawyer a high five. There was the sound of a beer can cracking and fizzing. Okay, kids. Fallow said. This was fun, but now we're done. I'm not getting diddled out of a quarter mill to play paintball with a bunch of clowns dressed like extras from Lord of the Rings. He took one step toward the door, and Stockton grabbed his bicep. Give him five more minutes. Please tip. And then Stockton nodded at the birdcage. Besides, don't you want to see what he's got there? Fallow stared at the hand on his arm until Stockton let go. Then he moved his gaze, that look of almost terrifying emptiness, upon Charn. Charn returned the look with a daydreaming calm. At last, Fallow shifted his attention back to the TV. The video cut to a trophy room back in Charn's Rumford farmhouse. It was decorated like a men's smoking club with a deep leather couch, a couple of battered leather chairs, and a mahogany liquor cabinet. The wall was crowded with mount mounted trophies, and as Stockton watched, the CEO, dressed now in flannel pajama bottoms and an ugly Christmas sweater, hung the latest head. The bearded fawn gawped stupidly at the room. It joined a little over a dozen other bucks with glossy, curving horns. There was also a trophy that looked at first glance like the head of a white rhino. On closer inspection, it more nearly resembled the face of a fat man with four chins and a single, stupid, piggy eye above the tusk of a nose. What's that? Peter whispered. Cyclops, Stockton replied softly.
Titles swept across the screen. Trophies are kept in a climate-controlled room at Charms. Successful hunters may visit with 48 hours advance notice. Tea and refreshments provided at small additional charge. Mr. Fowler said, I don't know what kind of asshole you think I am. The kind of asshole who has too much money and too little imagination, Charn said mildly. I am about to take some of the former and provide you with a bit of the latter, much to your benefit. Fuck this, Fowler said again, but stalked and squeezed his arm once more. Peter looked around. It wasn't faked. My dad's been. Christian nodded to the covered bird crage. Go on and show us, Mr. Charn. You knew anyone who saw that video would figure it was a fake, but people have been paying you scads of money anyway, so there's something under that sheet that's worth a quarter of a million dollars. Yes, Charn said. Almost everyone who sees the video thinks of costumes and special effects. In an age of artifice, we recognize reality only when it shows us its claws and gives us a scratch. The worlds have sensitive eyes and ears, and the electric lights of our world cause them exquisite pain, hence the red light bulb. If you remove your smartphone from your pocket and attempt to video what you are about to see, I will ask you to leave. It wouldn't be worth the trouble anyway. No one will believe what you recorded, much as you do not believe my video, and you will never travel through the little door. Do you understand? Fallows didn't reply. Charn looked at him with bland, speculative eyes for a moment, then leaned forward and tugged the sheet off the birdcage. They resembled chipmunks, or maybe very small skunks. They had black silky fur and brushy tails with silver rings running up them. Their tiny hands were leathery and nimble. One wore a bonnet and sat on an overturned teacup, knitting with toothpicks. The other perched on a battered paperback by Paul Cavanaugh, and was awkwardly reading one of the little comic strips that came in a roll of Bazooka Joe gum. The tiny square of wax paper was as large for the world as a newspaper would have been for Stockton. Both of the creatures went still as the sheet dropped away. The world with the comic strip slowly lowered it to look around. Hello, Mehdebel, said Mr. Charn. Hello, Hutch. We have visitors. Hutch, the one with the comic, lifted his head and his pink nose twitched, whiskers trembling. Won't you say hello? Charn asked. If I doesn't, will you poke my beloved with a cigarette again? Said Hutch in a thin, wavering voice. He turned to address Stockton and Fallows. He tortures us, you know. Charn, if one of us resists him, he tortures the other to force our obedience. This torturer, Charn said, doesn't have to bring you picture stories to read or yawn for your wife. Hutch flung aside the Bazooka Joe strip and jumped to the bars. He looked through them at Christian, who shrank back into the couch. You, sir, I see shock in your eyes, shock at the indecency <coughs> and cruelty you seize before you. Two intelligent feeling beings imprisoned by a brute. <coughs> Wow, it's tough to do that high voice. Who displays us to wring money out of his fellow sadists for a hunt with no honor. I'm hoping I sound a little like Mickey Mouse. I plead with you, run, run now. Spread the word that the sleeper may yet awake. Someone may yet revive her with the breath of kings so she may lead us against the poisoner, General Gorm, and free the lands of Palinode at last. Find Slowfoot the fawn. Oh, I know he lives still, but has only lost his way home or been bewitched to forget himself some wise and tell him the sleeper still waits for him. <clears throat> Christian began to laugh a little hysterically. Wild. Oh, man, for a minute I didn't get it. It's like ventriloquism, right? Fallows glanced at the boy and exhaled. Long, slow deflation. Sure, pretty good. You've got a little amplifier in the base of the birdcage and someone transmitting in the next room. You had me there for a minute, Mr. Charn. We recognize reality only when it shows us its claws and gives us a bite, Charn repeated. Go on then. Put your finger in the cage, Mr. Fallows. Fallows laughed without humor. I'm not sure I'm up on my shots. The whale is more likely to get sick from you than the other way around. Fallows eyed Charn for a moment and then poked a finger into the cage with a brusque, almost careless courage. 
Hutch stared at it with golden, fascinated eyes. But it was Mahitabel who sprang, clutched the finger in both of her sinewy little hands, and cried, For the sleeper! For the empress! And fastened her teeth on Fallow's fingers. Finger. Fallows yanked his hand away with a shout. The sudden force of his reaction knocked Mahitabel onto her back. Hutch helped her up, muttering, Oh, my dear, my love. She, <clears throat> Oh, my dear, my love. She spit the blood on the floor of the cage and shook her fist at Fallows. Fallow squeezed his hand closed. Blood dripped from between his fingers. He stared into the cage like a man who has been administered a powerful, numbing sedative. I felt their shouting into my hand, he muttered. It's all real, Fallows, Stockton said, real enough to sink its teeth into you. Fallows nodded once in a dazed sort of way without looking from the birdcage. In a distracted tone, he said, how much is that deposit again, Mr. Charn? That's it. Yes. I read that and I want to read it again. I want to finish. Well I need to finish it and find out what <laughs> happens because I can never. And then not, even though I read things, I never remember the endings again. But anyway, thank you very much. By the way, before we start with questions, our next few readers, we have no idea how long the lockdown is going to last or how long we're going to be doing it virtually, but we've been scheduling it month by month. And the next few months, we have November 18th, Cat Rambo and William Gibson. December 16th, Justin Key and Priya Sharma. Uh, January 20th, Lauren Bukas and Usman T. Malik. February 17th, Kathleen Jennings and Shveta Thakrar. And March 17th, um, Jeff Ford. And I think we have Karen Warren. I can't remember if she had confirmed or not. And in April, we have Nalum Hopkinson. I really don't think we're going to be live. We're going to be in person again until like, maybe late next year or so we'll continue doing this and and the, the good thing of course is we can have people from all over the world if they're willing to do this at three in the morning for them <laughs> i mean priya sharma has to go first because she's a doctor and she's in england and so she has to you know she has to get up the next day to go to work um so anyway so i hope that, that people will I join miss us going to a bar and a bookstore and hearing a live reading Oh, I know. Well, it is live. It's especially it's nice. It's especially nice at KGB, <laughs> you know, because you're crowded in with a bunch of friends, and in between the readings or afterwards or whatever, there's a lot of good talk about books and fantasy and you know genre and what's happening. And I always love that. Yeah. So anyway, well done. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, go on. I was just gonna say, well done, Joe. I, I haven't read that collection. That's really a great story and. I'm also impressed that uh, animal or <laughs> monster cruelty is, is fine. <laughs> you can you can murder all the fawns yeah, and torture the, all the worlds. Uh, that you I want wish to. I could tell you that there's a happy ending in this story for Hutch and Mahitabel, but unfortunately, it's they don't it doesn't it doesn't come out so well for them. And I just wanted to mention it just also publicly because I I haven't had the pleasure of reading it yet, so we didn't plan. Yeah, I know, our, right? Our, you know, our theme theme for the evening. No, it's absolutely, yeah. Synchronicity, you know. Yeah. Right. It's kind yeah. of eerie. Yeah. Um, yeah. So bring. So I ask your questions. In the meantime, we can start with a couple of questions. Um, Lair, you've been working on crime thriller novels the last few years. Are you going to go yeah, back I never to left, or horror? Uh, but it is something that comes up quite frequently. Um, much to the dismay of my publisher, probably the, the the series. There's three novels now. The latest is Worst Angels, and which is really good. It's that's a very good novel. I read it. It's terrific. Well, and it's and dark cosmic and it's got horror, horror no it. less, or at least it's it's cosmic horror adjacent. But in all seriousness, uh, I've been working on less short fiction the last three or four years because I'm a slow writer, and if I'm working on a novel, that's just pretty much what I'm doing. But uh, I have quite a few, like the, the story that I was reading from tonight is one of about six or seven that I hope to have done in the next year. So um, I'm working on, I'm, I am working very hard on, on that. I'm also working on a horror novel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to ask a question, Matt? Sure, Joe, um, you, you referenced in your story, The Sound of Thunder by Ray Bradbury. Yeah. Uh, 
to classic is that is that a an influence on fawn i mean so the 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 um it is totally you know um uh i, I think in in a bigger way you know the the plot of fawn is basically i'm i love a certain kind of ya fiction you know i love stories about plucky basically decent english children going through a wardrobe and coming out to a fantasy world full of like you know badgers talking in cockney accents you know and they'll have adventures over there and they'll learn some important lessons about themselves and about decency you know and and i'm a connoisseur of those kind of stories but i was thinking about it um you know about a little over a year ago and i was thinking how come it's always decent little children who find their way into Wonderland or Narnia, you know, or Oz? Um, how come it's never someone, you know, with a more mercantile heart and a crueler sensibility? And then I just sort of popped into my head a kind of sound of thunder thing. What if someone started running hunts into a place like Middle Earth or Narnia? you know, um, curated hunts where you could bag an orc or a fawn or a cyclops. Yeah. Um, and the story spilled out and, and became, um, you know, um, one of the, one of the final pieces for full throttle. And, and I got lucky and they, they picked it up as a, you know, Netflix picked it up as a possible film and, um, you know, um, um, seems to be a story people like. Oh, so is it going to be a film? You don't know yet. I read a brilliant script for it. I don't know. I mean, you never know until the cameras are rolling. But I, I read it. Uh, Jeremy Slater, uh, the scriptwriter Jeremy Slater, who worked. I think he worked on. I'm probably going to screw this up. I think he worked on Umbrella Academy, um, mm -hmm. and um, he wrote a killer script for it. So hopefully something will happen with it. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Daniel Brown. Uh, Daniel asks a question for Laird. In Blood Standard, the walrus scene acts as an inciting incident of sorts for Isaiah, the main character. Can you talk about how that came about and what inspired it? Sure. A couple of things, though. Uh, somebody, I, I can't see who it was in the chat, was asking if I had like a non-evil animal. Don't read, for the love of God, don't read <laughs> that. Because part of the reason that, that Isaiah, who is a mafioso at the time the story begins, leaves the mafia is because he accompanies a bunch of wise guys made men on a walrus hunt, a walrus slaughter, not a hunt. They, they go out and they kill a whole pile of walruses. And the inspiration was from once again, like the, the creepy dog story from something that actually was a big news story up in Alaska back in the late eighties, early nineties. It was between 89 and 92. I always, I always forget unless I'm looking at my notes, but they caught it on videotape. And what it was, was a wall, it was a wall uh, ivory hunt. And it was just it was horrible. They just went out and butchered a bunch of animals and took the and took the tusks and whatnot. And yeah, that was the inciting incident. And it's not so much that the uh, my character is necessarily, uh, you know, a PETA approved member, but it's more just that was just sort of the the final straw for him. It was sort of like kind of a statement about debauched American excess. It wasn't even so much like if they would have just gone out and everybody would have shot a walrus, he probably would have just suffered it. But it was the excess that he finally just realized that was what he couldn't stand about working with these rich bastards. Uh, one other thing, though, since I'm talking to Daniel Brahm, I actually uh, had the pleasure of reading Mr. Brahm's uh, upcoming, or it may even be out now, but I, I read it in manuscript form, his collection, Underworld Dreams, and it's absolutely bloody fantastic. Like I, was, I mentioned earlier, I, I've had the pleasure of reading a few manuscripts this year, and that was a fabulous, uh, fabulous manuscript. I'm reading it now. It is really good. Yeah. I haven't read it yet. It's really good. And, mm -hmm. I, and I say this with, with deference. It's like Jimmy, there's like this Jimmy Buffett element, like, but, but dark, but dark. Jimmy Buffett goes on a bender and it's not a it's not a pleasant one. He's he hasn't lost his shaker salt, he's lost his fucking mind. And he's <laughs> he's touring these different places and crazy shit's happening. Yeah. Highly recommended. It's a I would say like fantastical magical realism with little jolts of horror in it. Well, we have a question from somebody that wants to see what's on your bookshelf behind you, but I don't think you can move your camera. So we were talking about this, I think, before we went live. If you guys 
uh, Laird, you just recommended uh, a book. Um, Joe, you got any uh, anything that you'd like to recommend to uh, the audience? I think that isn't our sponsor uh, Tor's Nightfire imprint on it audio. Is. Yeah. One, one book that Nightfire <laughs> is publishing. Right there, you go. One one book that Nightfire is publishing either later this year or early next year is Katrina Ward's Brilliant: The Last House on Needless Street, which is. Um, one of the best horror novels I've read in the last couple of years and ingenious in the way Gone Girl is ingenious. Um, it is, it is one of these rare books that you read and finish and think, Oh shit. I, maybe I ought to just read it again right now because you know, you'll see the book in a completely different way based on this, based on its final revelations. Um, so that was, that was pretty terrific. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. There's a lot of good stuff out there. Um, I believe in Sturgeon's Law, 10%, and everything else is probably not very good, but you'll never be able to catch up on the 10% that's coming out. It's true. It's true. I collect my books. I mean, every year I have, I receive, I don't know how many books for years best, and I only keep maybe, I don't know, maybe even 1%, but over 30 years I've got a house full of fucking books. <laughs> All I actually it. just weeded out. I actually just went through a whole process of weeding out over 700 books um, <laughs> to give to libraries and to donate because, um, you know, I needed the room on my shelves. And there were certain books I could see that either like I had read and I was ready to let go of or I had been carrying for 30 years and was pretty clearly never going to read. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting rid of books I'm moving in a few months and I need to – I can't take them all with me. I don't want to take them all with me. I'm kind of inundated with books, <clears throat> and I'm tired. Yeah. Of, you know. I lost to stop taking donations because of the virus, so I'm I don't know what to do with my extra books. Oh, extra books. Yeah. I was going to say since we're talking about books and stuff, um, 20th Century Ghost remains one of my favorite collections. I think that was really a fabulous well, yeah, book of a art. Good time. Thank you. And. I'm, I'm sure everybody's read it by now, but if you haven't read it, my favorite story from there, I don't think it's the best story. I think actually uh, my father's mask or something like that is so intricate. I, but I but my, my favorite story in there because of the br just the brutality in it, uh, uh, that's kind of sugary coated until you get there is the cape. I think the oh, cape. Oh, hey, thank you. It's, it's, it's elegant in its simplicity like a weapon, like a knife. In other words, there's not, there's no moving parts on it. This is not, there's no trickery, there's no wordsmithery. It's, it's a, it's, I mean, it's beautifully written, but it's just, okay, I'm gonna tell you a story about something that's happened to me once, you know, and it goes places. It, it's very, uh, almost shock. I mean, I'm a cynical guy. I mean, I was cynical when I read it, and I thought that was a really shockingly delivered blow. It was a real punch well, thank in you. it. So, you know, um, without giving, hopefully, without giving anything away, in a sort of cape adjacent conversation if you ask me who was the scariest fictional villain this side of um hannibal lecter i'd say probably homelander from the mm. new boys tv show that is yeah. an absolutely the idea of superman drawn as a narcissistic uh, sociopath absolutely deeply upsetting and chilling and anthony Starr is um I don't know if you ever watched uh, Banshee. It was a, it was a, a Skinamax, as they say, series a few years ago, which is basically a graphic novel brought to brought to TV. He played uh, this the pivotal uh, the POV character, the guy posing. Banshee was written by a really good writer. Um, I loved it. Was Banshee possibly written by Michael Fuller, who might actually be working on the Lock and Key show now? I, I think have it a, was probably one of them. Um, it was either Michael Michael Fuller or Brian Fuller. I just I just I just want to commend though um, all the acting on there was great. I mean the actors really ate up chewed up the scenery. But Star, I became a, a big fan of Star. Um, Does someone in the co comment section know who wrote Banshee? Help us out! Come on, man. We're just sitting here looking at our. Friends. Someone in the comment section knows who wrote Banshee, and they'll help us out. It, it may take a second for them to come in. There's a little bit of a delay, but in yeah. the meantime, we got a question from. Uh, Mayfair Messiah, Joe, what is your favorite romance? <laughs> um, gee, probably, I mean, probably Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller is, you know, this terrifically 
um, moving and beautiful and vividly written um, um, love story. Um, what else have I really liked that was I, I like I like a good romance more than just but it needs to be but it needs to be like you know candy coated and horror or fantasy or you know a thriller but ultimately love stories are kind of where it's at and sort of my you know what I'm really into um, um, I'll have to think about that some more other favorite romances I mean I'm not sure anymore i mean i wrote i re used to read romances in my early 20s and late teens but i don't think i'm in i'm not into romance anymore harold robbins i just like crime i just like <laughs> violence in my books <laughs> yeah. well i think i mean i i mean you know i'm 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 really into suspense you know, that's the thing that I care most about in my reading. And I think um, the good romance is always packed with, you know, this intense, keen sense of, you know, will they or won't they? Will that it happen for them? The, the X-Files. The X-Files. Oh, gosh, yeah. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Is that a romance? Mm -hmm. but of course, yes, it's a romance. Yeah. So the X Files succeeded most, especially as a romance, not as a work of horror fiction. Although it did some great well, horror fiction. The individual fiction. pieces, the long term was not horror, but the individual monster of the week, some of them are pretty sharp. You know. Pretty mm -hmm. I've I've said for a long time that the X Files ended when they when Rolling Stone magazine published the cover, put put, put Duchovny and Anderson on the cover in bed together. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, everyone who was viewing the show got what they really wanted mm -hmm. and no longer, no longer needed the show. You know, yeah. the moment we saw them in bed together, we were like, finally, thank you. And we we're done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you've got a point there. You know, when I was a kid, I loved historical romance. I mean, we were in the wilderness, so we, we read everything, but I actually enjoyed historical romance and I even enjoyed some Barbara Cartlands, but these days, and looking back, my favorite romances weren't explicitly romance packaged that way. They would be noir novels or crime novels where this broken down detective scrapes it together because he wants to ask the waitress out, the hot waitress, or the starlet who sees something in that scuzzy dude, you know, the author's fantasizing, I, I guess. But. These people would see anything, well, these young women, these young vital women would see anything in these broken down 20 year older dudes who like, were shitheads. I mean, from the woman's yeah, point Yeah, nothing like real life I, or anything. I never got it. I'm sorry, this does not work for Dude, me. Stop. Giuliani's <laughs> looking around like, what? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah. We have a question for both guests. David, Ellen, she, wait a minute. Do you know he wrote Banshee? Oh, yeah. Robert. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. This one. Shickle-wee? Shickle-wee? Shickle Hi, Amy. <laughs> Hi, Amy. Uh, we have a question for both. Uh, maybe it's easier to do horror when the world feels horrific, but how are you finding the wherewithal to write these days? Having a hard time myself. You go, Joe. I mean, I mean, the thing is, is like um, it, my answer on this is super depressing and not really like you know, like the first. It's not an inspiring answer. Um, I'm really buried in the mechanics of, of writing each paragraph and each page and successfully, you know, um, capturing what a character would do in each situation as, as the story sort of rolls along. And so like the stuff that I write isn't scary, you know, it's about as scary as stacking a pile of wood next to the fireplace. It's, you know, I do get attached to my characters. I do get sometimes swept away. I don't want to pretend it's all mechanical. But but mostly when I'm scared or when I'm really, you know, uh, emotionally gripped by a story, it's someone else's story. It's not mine. Um, you know, I've just got, I'm just, when I'm working on a horror story, it's up so close. I'm looking at it so closely at each of the fine details that it's, I don't really connect with it emotionally on that level. And so, and, and, I'm, and I'm always thinking about when I'm writing a story, I'm always thinking about why is the reader still reading? Mm 
You know, why there's so much else they could do. How am I going to hold the reader's attention pinned to the page? And that's the game. Sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, page by page. How do I keep you interested? But Joe, uh, when you finish 20, 10 years later, five years later, even five months later, do you read that piece and what do you get out of it? I mean, how do you react to it when you read it when it's done? Do you have... I always think, I always think there's too many words on the page. I mean, when I look at, I still, I still have to look at it. I still look at it as a technical challenge, mm -hmm. you know, even 10 years later, reading that section from Fawn, the thing that haunts me is the feeling that it should be half as long as it is, mm -hmm. that I, that I overwrote that section. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a wicked overwriter and I'm always trying to figure out how to make, how to get less on the page. Cause people, when people read, when people read, they actually don't want to look at a bunch of words on the page. You know, there's nothing worse than turning a page and seeing like a whole block of prose without a single paragraph break. It kills something in your heart. It breaks your spirit. And you're like, oh, God, I'll look at my phone instead. You know, and so I'm always trying to look to make it leaner, meaner, all killer, no filler. Um, Laird, what about you? About the reaction you know, to what's going on? Well, it, it's, it's a little complicated. In a lot of ways, I agree with Joe. I mean, that's about 80. It's just that there's like a spectrum of emotions that I go through and how I even come come into writing a story is kind of a weird thing, emotional state that I get into. But yeah, generally speaking, uh, I'm rarely affected by the story. I'm more caught up in, this is just, I, like I'm just elbow deep in, in guts and I'm just like, oh, how do I, how do I rescue this thing? But um, years later, though, I, and I have the same damned feeling. I'm always pleased if it bothers me or I have any frisson or something like that from something I wrote. Because 99% of the time, I'm going, oh, my God. I, has anybody actually said, seen this? And maybe I could, oh, maybe somebody will reprint it and I could rewrite it. Because that's how I feel about it. But mm -hmm. how I'm being affected, you know, I think we're all, whether we realize it or not, are definitely being affected by the situation. I'm not so much being affected by the quarantine. I mean, I haven't really left the house much in nine months, but I never did anyway. And when I lived up in Alaska, I lived in the woods. So this is just like an excuse. Now I don't have to go anywhere. I'm like, oh, dang, I don't have to go to New York. I can just sit here on the phone, you know, the camera. Well, okay, I guess I will. No, I love that. I don't love why, but I, the, the, the isolation is just bonus writing time. Mm -hmm. I am much more affected, though, by the fact that this is a serious situation. It's just getting more serious. And, of course, you know, there's all kinds of other ramifications politically and, and whatnot that I think we're all very tired and we don't trust anybody anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice quote from the thing. We're all very tired and no one Nobody trusts, trusts anyone anymore. Nobody trusts anyone anymore. Yeah. I, I just want to throw in another thing, which is, like, you know um, – for me, my work is comforting. I actually have been, I've actually been fooling around with the theory of comfort food horror, that there's, there are certain horror movies and stories we like not because they do original things, but because we know exactly what they're going to do. Okay. And, sure. and, and rather than it, yes, we're scared. Yes, we jump when we're supposed to jump. But another part of us is almost like, you know, a child hearing a fairy tale at bedtime, you have confidence that the wicked will be punished and the innocent will be um, saved, protected, but validated. But that's not what happens in, some, in much horror, in a lot of horror. And it shouldn't. I mean, I don't want that to happen. I mean, yes, on one level, emotionally, yes, I want those people to be saved. But as a, as a horror reader, I don't. You know, it's like, well, then it's not horrific anymore. So I have this tug in, as a reader and I guess as an editor. I think that when you read most horror fiction, that, that usually by the final pages, daylight breaks. You know, daylight breaks and Dracula turns to power. <laughs> And that's comforting. That's comforting. There's deep, there's ter a terrific sense of comfort to take from the idea that no matter how dark it gets, eventually daylight breaks. But you know, what, what if it's dystopian, it's a novel or a story about daylight doesn't break anymore. The sun has gone. That's dystopic. I mean, how do you deal with that? 
I mean, daylight's not going to, what if daylight never comes? Well, the farther from, re I actually find horror fairly comforting. We were, I was on, uh, I was talking to the Lovecraft Circle of Mexico the other day. And obviously not everybody shares that some people have a very visceral reaction. I mean, as some of the people in the comments, you know, you mention certain bloody things and that's enough to really upset them. But for me, I've never been afraid of horror. The jump scare, yes, the what, what Joe was describing a minute ago, the, the knee jerk reaction. But you're not hurt when the doctor whacks you in the knee and you're like, you're not hurt at all. Uh, but you but you have this autonomic response. The bottom line is horror is actually, for me, I'm not speaking for other people, but for me, it's much more comforting to explore. Like growing up, I read, I read Stephen King plenty. Stephen King only frightened me when he wrote the Bachman books or when he wrote stories that were like the ladder is my favorite Stephen King story about the girl hanging on the ladder and uh, the, the brother creating the pile of hay beneath it because that could happen. Salem's Lot, it's not gonna fucking happen. I loved it. It's visceral, it's wonderful, but I don't, I'm not worried about vampires. The, the trailer trash activities, beating each other, smothering the kid in the crib, that stuff bothered me. Like the human elements he brings in bother me. But as a whole, when you wrap it in Lovecraftian horror, for example, there's a distancing. For me, there's a filtering process there. Uh, if I wanna be horrified, I read something like uh, Cormac McCarthy, something that has yeah. happened or could happen without the filter. In other words, it's not, I'm not saying that things, uh, realistic things don't intrude upon a horror story. I'm just saying, but then the monster comes. I'm like, oh, okay, thank God there's a monster. The monster isn't Ted Bundy. And I'm, I'm talking about supernatural horror. Obviously suspense horror is a whole different thing. I think a lot of good horror, you know, that the underlying message of a lot of our favorite horror stories is um, things can get so much worse than you think they can get. Or are already. <laughs> or are, right. But, but if you if you stand true with the people you love, um, and and um, you know can remain morally centered, some of you might get through it. If you're willing to make if you're willing to make tough sacrifices, the worst things in the world can be driven back. Um, and I, I think it's hard not to find that message somewhat comforting. You know. Well, you know that's a really good point. Because I do believe that how you live is, is uh, that's what's important. We're all going to, we're all going to kick it. It doesn't matter whether you're eaten by a werewolf or a bear or you die of cancer or your heart just gives out. And so I've had this discussion. It's the anti legati thing. Life, it, for me, life is worth living. We arrive at the same conclusion. We're all screwed. But I do think kicking and punching on your way out is a noble, is a noble reaction. And mm -hmm. I will say that horror no matter whether it's nihilistic horror or whether it's more, you know, uplift has an uplifting adventure message. There's, there is a similar message there in a lot of the better horror. And that is fighting is worth it. And it's another word for heroism. I also think a lot of horror tends to remind us of our shared humanity, which is something many other genres obscure, you know, um, the teaming up aspect. Right. The, There's a lot of us versus them in much in a lot of other fiction and a lot of other storytelling. But, you know, um, um, in the zombie apocalypse, we're all breakfast, you know. And so, you know, we've got to we've got to stand together. And I think that that's powerful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Blair, do you have a horror movie you want to recommend for Halloween? <laughs> yeah, um, I just alluded to it. It's uh, it'd probably be better even if we wait another month. But some parts of the country, uh, we're under they're 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 getting in their first dump of snow. So the thing, John Carpenter's reboot, never go wrong. The Howard was it the Hawks from the fifties? That is a uh, and of course it all comes from Campbell's uh, Who Goes There, which I actually would like to see the unadulterated. I mean, I love Car Carpenter's version of it is just well, it will always be a classic. But Campbell's. There's this rawness to it and understatedness. The monster isn't a bloody, it, it, it achieves the same effect. You're, they're all fucked, but in a different way. Like drinking milk from the infected cow is how a lot of them buy it. I, I would like to see that, but that, that is Carpenter's, the thing is, uh, it's for any time of the year with the family, but I think Halloween is particularly, especially the colder parts of the great country in uh, Canada would not be a bad choice. 
Ellen, do you have a fright film or some terrifying television to recommend? Nah. <laughs> I, I don't watch that much horror. I mean, I do. I mean, I, there are things I've loved that I think are horrific and that are really good. Personal, um, personal shopper with Kristen. Stewart. Oh, I've heard that was great. I still haven't seen it. It's, it's a ghost and it's really, really creepy. Um, Hi, Amy. It's very subtle. It's subtle and creepy. And I really like that. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the thing. I saw that in preview, and I have not been able to watch it since. <laughs> I, mean, I want to, but I'm – and actually, I read an article about it that was very a really good essay about it that made me think that maybe I'm ready to watch it again, but I don't know if I want to watch it alone. You know, that's the thing. And I'm mean, when I was a kid, I watched the original one. And I mean, James Arness is a carrot. Wow, a giant carrot. <laughs> I mean, when I watched it, we had on channel, I think it was on channel 11, which was, or nine, which was very fuzzy. We only had like four channels on the TV. And one, and it was very fuzzy and snow all the time, which you call snow. And I assumed that that was the TV. And then they had a, um, in a movie theater film form, they actually had a remastered print of it of the original the thing and it turns out no that's what it looked like it was like that <laughs> you know the print was kind of i mean it was deliberately fuzzy but there was you know and it wasn't all that scary although there were scary parts i mean certainly like you know the uh, the dogs there were frozen dead dogs they opened this you know in the back room um so you know that really impressed me as a kid i loved horror movies as a kid and they were mostly cheesy ones though i mean i'd watch them after school um, really stupid ones, you know. Like, I love it all, man. I, I love like the scary it. ones and the cheesy ones from the old days alike. Yeah, yeah. And, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of recent. Well, Get Out, I loved it. Us, I loved. Um, Herit heritage? No, what is it called? Hereditary. I have such mixed Hereditary. feelings. Hereditary. Oh, shit. That's a scary yeah, one. I, yeah, well, I have very mixed feelings about it. And I don't know. There, I have I really don't, for me, for some people, it's animals dying. For me, it's mutilation. <laughs> yeah. And it's really Ellen, hard to watch people mutilated. <laughs> well, and I had mixed feelings about hereditary too. I didn't know whether to scream or piss myself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Brad, what about you? Have you seen anything? It was, good? it was so unnerving. It was very mm. unnerving. And um, I'm, I'm not I, don't, gonna, I don't actually watch a lot of horror films, but my, my wife and I, we have a tradition where we watch uh, Ch the Charlie Brown Halloween special. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually like really sad. Like like Linus just goes into the field and like it's so sad. It's so sad, and it's kind. It's actually kind of horrific in the sense that he just has such high hopes and they're just defeated. But um, one of my favorite, I don't know if you would classify it horror. It's really kind of campy. But the gate. Have you guys ever seen mm -hmm. that? I remember the game. I don't yeah. remember. It's like this eighties, like like yep. basically like these kids accidentally open a, a portal to hell. Um, and it's just it's just a lot of fun and really campy like like horror. I, I just if you haven't seen it, it's it's fun. I, I like that one a lot. Joe, oh, I've got a I've got a shocker lined up to, for tomorrow. I'm going to watch the presidential debate. Oh god, yeah, he's going to bail. I can't think of anything he's gonna scarier. Gonna happen? He's going to bail. He's not going to do it. You think you don't think Trump will? You don't think that Donald Trump will show? He'll show up. Mm, he'll maybe. show up. Uh, they got the mute button now. They got two minutes mute. I know. I, know. I don't know. <laughs> the most, I saw a profoundly shocking film, a film that really worked on my nerves a few days ago. And, um, I, and I highly recommend it, but it's intense. And it's in a genre I don't normally like because um, I, I don't think much of torture porn as a rule. There was a whole rash of that about yeah. Oh, you know, about ten years ago, and uh, I don't really think that's that's effective horror. I think that that horror works best when you fall in love with some characters and then you see them facing the worst. So, so good horror is about empathy, not sadism. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm not a big the to, the whole torture porn thing is sort of like not really my bag. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I saw a movie called One Br, which is on Netflix. And it's either a metaphor for it's either a metaphor for Scientology or for social media, but it's scary as fuck and and really intense and goes in a really shocking direction. And I was completely 
you know, completely wrapped up in it. Mm-hmm. And I thought it managed, even though it, even though it puts a character through some really intense suffering, I did think that it still managed to keep its heart in the right place, that it still was about compassion and empathy as opposed to mm-hmm. let's just do vile things to a human right. being to, you know, oh, for some consideration. It would just be like one bedroom. One BR. One mm-hmm. BR, yes. Huh. Have you ever- maybe for all I know, it's a documentary about actually trying to find an apartment in LA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any more questions, anybody? I don't know if we get them in now. We're all, we're gonna uh, wind up soon. Um, we're all watching questions? the comments. Right. Do you guys have any questions for each other? Um. Any questions for each other? I made the comment I wanted to make. I just wanted to compliment you on that. Well, on thank that, you. You're on awesome. that collection and that's, I mean, obviously everything is great, but I just oh, really enjoy that. <laughs> I, do, I, I just think that was a great, that story really surprised me. I think people should run out and grab that who haven't gotten it. But um, I got one more movie recommendation for you. Yeah, so, let's have it. Um, sauna. Sauna. Uh, it's a, for, it. it's a foreign film. I said, I did watch it. I saw it. It's really weird. It's Swedish or something, isn't it? Yeah, I believe so. It's it's sure. subtitled. It's called I think in in the original language it's like the filth or something like that. But it's called sauna in English. Not to be there's a comedy. Don't don't mix them up. But it came out like around two thousand seven, two thousand six, somewhere in there. And it's essentially it's a group of uh, soldiers after a war, and they're back in I want to say the eighteen or seventeen nineties or you know it's it's way back when, and they're. Ages. I think it's supposed to be the Middle Ages. No, it's they, they have they have oh, guns and later. Okay. Yeah, oh, I love Scandi horror. Scandi horror is it's, uh, uh, it's not exactly Scandinavian. It's like German. It's, it's one of the great. It's one. Of, it, it's I. I would say it doesn't have a very good rating on you know the various rating sites. Take my word for it. It is. It's a slow burn, but it's just it's worth it, and it's um, beautifully filmed, beautiful cinematography, and it doesn't do what you think it's going to do because it really looks like at the beginning it's going to be you think you know what it's going to be about and how it's going to go and not at all and uh it's gripping and i i would i i think that's something i would recommend to you i've watched it in the last year and i i can't actually remember i remember bits of it i don't remember a lot of it but it was uh pretty affecting pretty effective good acting and i don't know that the characters are characters you can get behind but they're very fascinating the characters are fascinating and their story, as well as deals with their, there's like a, a Poe kind of element to it, and their story unfolds, their sins unfold over the course of the hour and a half. But uh, just the setting and the eeriness of it, and it really is, it really is frightening. Uh, as much as I can be frightened by a horror movie uh, in places. Let the right one in. Let the yeah. right one in. Well, that, that what's good. amazing about Let the Right One In is um, that is a story that has succeeded in every format it's been adapted to. So it was yeah. a brilliant fucking novel. Yeah. It was a great movie. Then yep. it was remade as an American film. And that, that was a, great. Yeah. And yeah. then they put it on stage, and that was great. I I let the right one in. You can't go in, can't go wrong with any version. Yeah, I missed it on stage. I was actually supposed to see it, but I think there was a snowstorm, and I and it was in Brooklyn, and I never got there. Ooh, but, it was so great! But the, but the movie, I love the original movie, was fabulous. Yeah. <clears throat> question from Daniel Brown for Joe. I love the most about Heart Shape Box uh, when they destroy the suit, thinking that will fix things. What is what is it about the structure of plans going wrong that is so effective and appealing? Um, I don't know because it reminds of it reminds us of our our you know clumsy the clumsy nature of humanity. You know, um, and also there's not much story in, you know, uh, a story about um, people making plans to do something difficult and then succeeding without a hitch just isn't very interesting. Um, You know, uh, I I think about, uh, I think almost like the perfect crime story is Fargo, which Mm -hmm. is just like someone with a bad idea putting it to action and then everything that can go wrong does go wrong in an increasing pile up of dead bodies and lost money until at the end you've got the cop saying to um, one of the criminals and that's your friend in the wood chipper <laughs> and all for a little bit of money. Linda, it's S-A-U-N-A. 
S A U N A. Sauna, like you take a sauna. Yeah, right. Oh, someone got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. So, uh, for a little bit of money. Oh, for a little bit of money. Yeah. Boy, the TV show, Noah Hawley's uh, TV show has been great too. I've seen the first two seasons. I have not seen the, the third and the fourth. I absolutely awesome. swear by those two seasons. Awesome. Yep. Uh, Fargo, Fargo, you mean? Fargo. Yeah. 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 Billy and Billy Bob Thornton. Oh, my God. Yeah. Warren Malvo in the first yeah. season. Yeah. Great. I love that show so much. Yep. Um, I, I cannot wait to see the next two. I've got some bad reviews. I don't know how it is, but the first two or three were great. Yeah. Um, well, this is a question for Joe, but um, why don't we ask Laird first, and then we'll ask Joe, uh, who is your favorite villain? Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. It take a minute. Laird, do you have a favorite villain? Oh, is it me? Um, yeah. We're waiting for you. <laughs> you know, I th I'm sorry, I thought it was Joe. Uh, oh, yeah. Actually, I like... Uh, Matt, you know, th this is an easy one actually for me. Mads Mickelson's uh, Hannibal is now my favorite. Oh, God, yeah, he's good. He's I used good. to love, and I used to swear by uh, no disrespect to Sir Anthony, but it, it also because it's unfair. Uh, Mickelson has, uh, you know, several years yeah. worth of scripts to develop. I mean, that's the great thing about Netflix and, and TV series in general, is you can develop these ideas that a movie just cannot. Oh. Can, can, Equally, equally written, uh, a TV series has a lot of advantages, and, can, and actors can grow into those roles. And I really think that his, not not Hannibal Lecter in general, but just his, how he inhabits that character, okay. is immensely entertaining. Can I just say one? I mean, uh, Al yeah. and Luther, the character Alice, Ruth. Um, oh, I yes, her. yes. He's fucking amazing, and I, I hope she comes back. I mean, the last, she maybe died, but she probably didn't die. She is amazing. She's a sociopath, but she is so lovable, <laughs> I think, and amazing. The chemistry they had together on that show was pretty yeah. amazing. I'm sorry, Joe, your turn. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, I don't know, because I'm more of a hero's guy, you know? <laughs> um, I want to have someone to root for, not someone to root against. Well, I mean, I, I guess my cheat for Alice, even though she's killing people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my cheat of an answer would be Walter White from Breaking Bad. Mm. Um, he's okay. like the greatest villain ever, you know, that anyone's ever written about. But I mean, but he's also, isn't he sort of the, I mean, he's an ant, is he a villain or an anti hero? Uh, I think he's a villain. I've I actually not villain. seen it. Oh. The, the, other, um, the other person isn't a person, the other villain that comes to mind is Bruce from The Shark from Jaws who I think is sort of the perfect menace. You know, uh, uh, the Dreyfus character says, all he does is swim, all she does is swim, eat, and make little sharks. That's all she does. Mm -hmm. And and I think that is such a- Why is that a villain? villain? Why is she a villain? She's the first great slasher, that's why. Or maybe, <laughs> I think. Yeah. I've yeah. always looked at Jaws as, and somebody else has beaten me to this. I think somebody did an essay about it, but I, I wholeheartedly agree with it. Jaws is a slasher. Yeah, just I know. as much yeah. as Michael Myers or the yeah, Terminator. Yeah. Yep. And she's motivated. I mean, they all have their motivations. Some are just more inscrutable. But look who she goes after initially: naked swimming in the ocean. You shouldn't have done that. That was really just not <laughs> smart. But in seriousness, it's a great. I mean, I, I agree. That's a great. Although I, I would disagree. Like where I see Walter White being, there's no antihero. He's a he's a villain who just yeah. sometimes does okay things. But it's arguable, right? That's just how I see him. But I think Jaws, boy, it's depending on how you look at it, you know, whether whether she's a villain or, or whether she's uh, an anti-hero. Uh, in some ways, you could almost, you know, say she's defending her area, but in other ways, she's kind of looking for trouble. So I'm not really, not really sure. I think I could go either way on that one. <laughs> I mean, actually, I think a lot of my f favorite horror movies and stories the villain is almost an unthinking, inevitable force, you know, that the heroes are defined against. So, like, Laird, you talked about how great John Carpenter's The Thing is. Yeah. But, like, the bad guy in The Thing is, like, it's like uh, this this self-replicating bacteria. It's um, us. Right, it's us. It's not really, it doesn't really have a personality. Well, Jaws doesn't have a Did you ever Peter Watches The Things? 
Peter Watts wrote a story, The Things, that one that was very popular a few years ago, and I love it. It's from The Things' point of view. Mm -hmm. From The Things' point of view, it is not a villain. It is just doing its thing. It doesn't care. Right. It's just rolling along, you know. It's being, a really great story, yeah. And it's not a villain, you know, which is why I don't consider it a horror story. <laughs> oh, come on. It's a horror story. Uh, well, we're coming up almost on nine o'clock, so that might be good. Go watch your show, Joe. You want to watch your shows? Yeah. Say that again. You said you wanted to watch your shows at nine. You're you're almost. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would, you know, I'd stay here and talk for another hour, but it's important for me to squeeze in at least one episode of Unsolved Mysteries this evening. Talk about disturbing. Uh, you know, I that's that's one of my binge watches. Uh, it's it's uh, and it's, I always have bad dreams if I watch it late. It's not anything in the show. It's the theme music. That piano <laughs> theme music hits in my head and crawls around like ants on my brain. Uh, right. Well, that might be a good place to end it then. Um, so, uh, Laird and Joe, please uh, hang on after uh, we sign off. Thank you. Thank you both for uh, for joining us uh, tonight. This was great. We really enjoyed the readings and the, you. your answers to our questions. And thanks to our audience for uh, for tuning in now and and later on when you watch us on YouTube. Um, this is Fantastic Fiction at KGB. And we will see you next month. So everybody Thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Have a good night.